on um, uh, uh, is a case study of Mali, and the, the general question was, what was is the impact of RNA on Mali? When I when I went there um, uh, the, for the last time to do some interviewing and and uh, visiting around the country for the for the project was about a, a little over a, a little less than a year ago. It was in, in um, July of 2011, and and Mali was a stable, quote-unquote, democracy. And I, I, everybody I met said it's a stable democracy. And so the first draft of this paper was, it's a stable democracy. What has been the contribution of aid? Um, and uh, I, I, I took too long to finish the, the paper. And, you know, busy with other things. And finally, I sat down to work on it in February. And I was more or less finished ready to send it to Danielle, and then there was a coup d'etat in, in Mali, and suddenly I had to change everything. Um, so, so now I sort of, it, it is quite handy, I think, for our case study, our, our book uh, of case studies, because this is the case where, you know, things went wrong. Um, we didn't have a case. That's very hard to, to say, you know, establishing that kind of counterfactual is very, very hard to say. But in retrospect, I was really struck by the sort of complacency of donors um, and their sort of assumption that things were stable. Uh, and. Um, for reasons linked to my other research, I was very aware of the Tuareg issues in the in north of Mali. Um, and so the risk of instability struck me as very real. I met some Tuaregs and, and in the case of some other research. And so, so I was very surprised that the donors basically didn't think the Tuaregs uh, are an issue. They thought it was a minor little annoyance uh, in the north, uh, and, um, and and certainly I I mean the don I, so I, I do think the donors could have done a lot more to address both the two to our grievances and generally imbalances in the country that that had um, I think political impl very deep political implications. Um, but, it, it, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be too critical of aid. I mean, I don't, in general, I, I'm not a person who thinks aid um, can play more than a, a minor supportive role in the development process. So since I believe that, when things go wrong, I, you know, I don't, when things go right, I tend not to give credit to the donors. So when things go wrong, I'm not going to blame the donors. Um, but so there, there are some, you, 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 a country like, like Mali has, has certain very specific um, structural problems, uh, regional imbalances, very high level of inequality, um, uh, very, very weak institutions, um, uh, deep, deep uh, urban-rural differences. And what's striking is, is just how these haven't changed. You know, if you look at donor reports from the 60s, they say, they say, they give this litany of issues. You look at donor reports today, they continue to give this litany of issues. So I, I think that aid is very good at, at um, providing services and, you know, the MDG campaign. And, um, but I think one of the real, uh, I think, disquieting implications of, of uh, of this case study is is that aid is not good at addressing these strategic issues, which may undermine political stability. Um, and I, I think that's that's uh, and that you know maybe it's too ambitious to expect aid to be able to resolve these things. But um, they, in some cases, it's clear that aid can't really play a role. One of the issues in Mali is 
very, very unusual for a democracy is the language of government, you know, the, the language that's in parliament is a language that only 10% of the people speak, right? I mean, the language of government, the language of the state is French, but 85%, maybe 90% of Malians don't, you know, don't really speak French, right? So, so that, to me, symbolizes this real cleavage between elite and masses, right? So could aid have lessened this major cleavage? Um, well, uh, in theory, yes, but the, the MDG campaign has, in fact, spent an enormous amount of attention and resources on improving literacy, which would be a way to have, get people to learn French. But nonetheless, if you look at the, that process of literacy and the, the conversion to French, it's really slow. I mean, here we are, 60 years after independence, and it's still true, you know. So, that's a case where can you, should the donors look at themselves and take blame for this? It's tough to say. But another case may, strikes me as, as clear. Um, every, every report on the Tuareg issue has said one of the problems is just how isolated and marginalized the Tuareg region is. We need to build a road from Bamako to Kidal. The road actually goes about halfway. This has been true since 1960, since the first Tuareg rebellion, you know, in 1962. The Tuareg, one of the key Tuareg grievances is build the road to Kidal. It's still not built. It's still not built. Now, I'm sure there are good reasons not to build it. You know, it's, um, Kidal is a tiny little town. It's a desert. Uh, it's probably, you know, I'm sure the World Bank economists have said that there are five roads that make more sense from an economic point of view, you know. But in terms of national unity and political stability in the country, it's been a key investment and it's not been made, you know. Despite um, six billion dollars of foreign aid in the last uh, 20 years. Like, the, some debates now are, you know, how important is democracy, or, um, you know, should the donors uh, uh, impose conditionality about elections? And those strike me as, as secondary issues. You know, um, Malians want democracy, they, and they showed it again this time. And, um, and I don't think democracy makes a huge difference, but I think it makes a positive difference, and that's another conclusion of our project. So those debates that are still very present in the donor community strike me as second order uh, issues. On, on the other hand, addressing the strategic underlying um, dynamics that really threaten national unity in these countries, that strikes me as, as more urgent. and and. And the donors need to talk more about these issues, you know, they, um, because ultimately, if Mali is going to be an imperfect democracy for a long time, and, um, you know, there are going to be issues of corruption, and that's kind of inevitable. Um, but uh, the, the, the current civil war could set development back in Mali 10 years, 20 years. I mean, one thing that's really striking is, is how centralized it is in, in, in the capital and how, how much the imprint of aid is, um, is urban biased that it's, and, and capital biased. And I, and I do think um, that, again, in part that's inevitable, but I do think uh, the donors need to look at themselves and, and really push to, to decentralize more, to, to get out to the countryside, to get out to the provinces much more um, in a country like mine. The, the parastatal designed and funded by the donors to help develop northern Mali to address uh, Tuareg grievance, that parastatal was in Bamako a 
thousand miles from the north. Because, be, presumably because the people who work there wanted to live in Bamako. Uh, the, but the failure of that Paris table to make any kind of difference was a source of great unhappiness on the part of the Tuaregs. Well, I, th I do think that in fragile countries, uh, there probably this failure to address strategic issues and, and, and structural constraints, I think, is, uh, is, is probably something that, that a lot of countries, you know, is true in a lot of countries. Uh, one, one other, I think, um, finding that I think is generalizable has to do with democracy assistance. So not development assistance, but specifically aid that tries to improve democracy. Um, the, the, the numbers from Mali, looking at the numbers, suggest that the donors only work on one dimension of the democracy problem. And that is the enhancement of vertical accountability. So the accountability of, of the government to voters, to people, right? And so, so there, a lot of assistance goes to uh, elections. But strikingly, a lot of assistance goes to human rights, to gender imbalances, to civic and political rights, voter registration. Virtually no aid goes to mechanisms of horizontal accountability. So, and by that political scientists mean uh, the judiciary and the legislative and their relationship with the executive branch. Right? So there's very little money that goes into party support. There's very little money that goes into legislative support. And very, very little money that goes into strengthening the independence of the judiciary. The, the last is that there's a bit more money. But strikingly, there's nothing, very, very small amounts of money going to, um, to parliament. So in Mali, out of you know, $800 million a year going to Mali, um, one, half a million went to the legislative branch. Um, and, and I think mechanisms of horizontal accountability are key to the survival of democracy uh, and to the quality of democracy, just as much as elections and, 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 and horizontal account, uh, vertical accountability. And so, and my sense is, and uh, Danielle agrees, and this just comes out in, our, in the other projects, is I, th I think this is generalizable. Um, it has to do with we don't like political parties, we think, and legislatures there. You know, as we say in, in America, it's like a sausage factory, and you don't want to look at how the sausage is made. You know? so, um, so I think there's just a natural distaste for, for parties, uh, pork barrel politics in the legislature. And, and so the donors don't, they just are not present there. And I think that's a mistake. In general, I mean, not even broader finding, I think, is, is that um, the aid to d democracy should be increased. There's, I mean, in the case of Mali, as far as I can tell, it's, it's one or two percent of total aid flows. Um, um, I don't know. The data is not good, but I think it should be five, six, seven percent. Fundamentally, the problem of democracy in low-income countries uh, is that the executive branch is too powerful vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of the government and vis-a-vis -vis the people. And um, both, both horizontal and vertical accountability are very important, you, particularly if you have a, a, a real cleavage between elite and masses. You, you, you don't want the elites to all be it, you know, together in a kind of elite cartel and not have, not be accountable to the masses through elections and vertical accountability, right? But the, the, at an institutional level, the ability to check the power of the executive branch, to make sure that um, uh, there's not corruption, to make sure that uh, 
um, decisions are thought through and acted upon, uh, to give a voice to opposite viewpoints, uh, you really need the legislature and, and uh, the judiciary. So in this case of Mali, the, the, the re one of the main reasons for the coup was just the lack of a response by the government to events in the north. And Malians were very unhappy. If you, you know, took the pulse of the, of the street in Bamako, uh, friends were telling me you know, six weeks before the coup, the government has to do something. This is deeply unpopular that, that they're losing all these battles in the north. And I think if, if that unhappiness had been voiced in, in parliament, it would have led the government to act more aggressively. And that might have then staked off the coup. It's hard to know, but I, that's what I mean by why you want the system of checks and balances uh, you know, within the national political institutions of the country. I mean, I feel very, very strongly that uh, part of the, this complacency about, about strategic issues um, has to do with this uh, myth of, of, uh, of non-interference and, and apolitical, the apolitical nature of politics. Uh, every donor decision ever in a country like Mali has political implications. Um, and uh, maybe I mean maybe that's the most uh, to me the most obvious implication is donors need to be aware of the political implications of what they do, and as we move to democracies, so as we move to systems in which there are elections, in which there is civil society, in which there are oppositions, um, then um, aid is even less uh, neutral. You know, uh, if you in an authoritarian system. Uh, for the, an authoritarian system to be legitimate, it has to make a claim that it represents 100% of the population. You know? In a democracy, it doesn't. It has to claim that it represents 51% of the population. Um, and so, in a democracy, if, if you're assisting the government, you're assisting the 51%, you're not necessarily assisting the 49 you know, unless we protect the rights of minorities and, and so on, uh, worry about a horizontal and vertical accountability and, and all that. So I, I think uh, this mythology of a kind of technocratic, apolitical foreign aid is dangerous, dangerous. But I'm a political scientist, so, I, you know, I think politics is important.